good to something. <laughs> Thank you. 
too young to have heard of that. <laughs> Probably not too many. In any event, uh, Barbara, I also want to tell you that what you've just talked about with these three rehearsals for months is why I never saw my father when I was growing up. But <laughs> aside from that, thanks so much. Um, I have a couple of uh, serious remarks and a couple of not so serious remarks. Hi, Carmen. It's so nice to have you back with us. Carmen Saparic was a member of our committee and our chorus for so many years, and uh, I wish she still performed with us, but she's performing anyway in Albany. As I... Uh, As I uh, near the end of my tenure as the chair of this committee, uh, I really want to thank you, Barbara, and I also want to thank your predecessor, John Furyk, uh, for the renewed interest that both of you, but particularly you, Barbara, and frankly, I don't have any idea where you are. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Couldn't see you. Uh, have shown in the entertainment activities of this association. I'm happy to say that you have sent a clear message that this building is open for fun as well as for social service and for profit. And the harder we work, I think the more we need this fun in our lives. And we really appreciate the balance that you have shown in encouraging entertainment functions, <coughs> including those of this committee. And I might add that we trust that we have also demonstrated anew to you and the association the hard work that our committee members uh, do. So we're very pleased from both ends in that regard, and thank you so much. Meanwhile, members of the audience, and wow, what a crowd, uh, welcome to what is still called Twelfth Night, but since this is March 8th, I decided to look in the dictionary to find out exactly what and when Twelfth Night was, uh, with the name Markowitz, you can imagine I needed to know. <laughs> and uh, what I learned is the Twelfth Night, by the way, which was, quote, formerly observed with various festivities, end quote, is the evening before Twelfth Day. That tells you a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> well, Twelfth Day is January 6th. I guess that means Twelfth Night was January 5th, which is when this show was actually supposed to have been performed in the first place. So according to my calculations, tonight is actually, I think, 75th night. So uh, welcome to 75th night. <laughs> As I'm sure you all know, uh, this show, which was supposed to go on on January 5th, was postponed because of a labor dispute here at the association and in many other commercial buildings uh, that led to a picket line that the governor chose to honor. And if I can be serious for a moment, I want to let this occasion pass, particularly as at least a part-time legal lawyer, without telling all of you how much I admire and respect the governor for adhering to his time-honored principles in an age when so many political figures seem to find it expedient to ignore the needs of working men and women. the governor until he is at least gently done, <laughs> I suppose it is not inappropriate for me to express my own feelings about this evening by quoting from that distinguished entertainer, Congressman Sonny Bono, <laughs> in, in remarks he made about that other great entertainer, Newt Gingrich. <laughs> According to the New York Times magazine, and I believe it or not, I'm serious, Sonny Bono appeared in November in Marietta, Georgia for what was billed as a Gingrich roast. But I can't roast Newt, Bono told the crowd. Instead, Bono recalled the magic of his first encounter with Gingrich. Everything he felt, and everything he said, and everything he believed, I believed. Well, that's the way I feel, and I hope that most of you feel about Mario Cuomo. So it's hard to roast him in that sense. But we will do so anyway. Nothing can stop us. And uh, somehow I'm sure that he will know just how to retreat. I also wanted you all to know one other thing, that when Governor Cuomo declined to appear in January because of the picket line, uh, we gave some fleeting thought to inviting that other governor, 
The one named Pataki is a last minute replacement. <laughs> when some of us talked about it, uh, we were sure that uh, Governor Pataki would have no problem crossing a picket line, <laughs> but we were afraid that he'd refuse to cross the city line. <laughs> so, we decided to postpone the show until our star could come. Before we begin, however, I did want to uh, also point out, as Barbara previously did, that this is a memorable show for us because it is, in a sense at least, our 50th anniversary. The very first Bar Association show, called May It Please the Court, uh, starred, among others, my dad, Arthur Markowitz, and it was performed for one night on the evening of March 28, 1946. So far as I know, there is one surviving member of that cast, and he is here tonight, my friend and my father's dear friend, the very distinguished Boris Kostelanitz. Boris? As they say, Boris, long life. You want to come up and sing with us tonight? <laughs> Boris is, thus may it please the court from that show, or thus may it please the court, and may you never, never, never sue your landlord be the cause whatsoever. Remember that? My dad used to sing me that. <laughs> I'm a great Now, just before I close, in another sense, there is one more survivor of that first show, and indeed of every subsequent show from 1947, through 1992, and that is my mother, Dr. May Markowitz, who will be 90 years young at the end of May. Now that we're done with the serious stuff, if I can figure out how to put this microphone back, it's past time for the fun to begin. And so, Without another word, and I hope not another screech, on with the show.
entertainment this evening, A Tragedy, written by our noble benefactor, Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, under his nom de plume, William Shakespeare. <laughs> Tonight's tale is a tale of unrelenting despair, unleavened by humor, of a man who strove for the heights, but fell backwards. Oh, he did he fall backwards. <laughs> As he traveled along his own boulevard of broken dreams to a lonely exile amidst the caverns of the Emerald City. Tis a tale of the overweening ambition of many men, <clears throat> of benign as well as hostile influence by powers both natural and unnatural. And lastly, it is a tale of undying love. The love of a woman for her man, and her man for higher office. <laughs> <laughs> and now, our players. <laughs> Who's there? I'm sorry, are you still open? The Queen's Democratic Club never closes. <laughs> I've come about the apparition. The ghost? There's no ghost. That's a myth. That's an old wives' tale. There's no ghost here. Yeah, well, I've heard all about strange goings on in this place just before dawn. Out of my way. I'm going to hang around. Suit yourself. It's midnight, Jack. Go on home. I'll spell you till morning. Thanks a lot. Has it been quiet here tonight? Not a mouse stirring. If you see Horatio, Fabian and Palomino, tell them to hurry. I'll leave the light on the porch for them. I hope we have a quiet night tonight. Yea, would it be so? Methinks it's still a peptic-inspired apparition. <laughs> Excuse me. What can we do for you? You want will drawn? You need a job with the county? Your wife's run off with her first husband. You need some money for a party? Oh, come on, be serious. I'm from the Queen's Bugle. I'm here to do a story about the ghost. My God! It's all over the county. Ah. Look, good sir, it's just a myth. There's no ghost. It certainly doesn't appear every night. Come on, Horatio. <laughs> Tell him the truth. Two nights ago, we were sitting around the clubhouse at around 1 AM when peace breaking off. Look, there, it comes again. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. It's, it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> Speak to it, Horatio. It's no use. It calls for Mario. Mario. And when seeing him not, it vanishes. <laughs> now and again to give legal advice to undeserving Democrats. So did you tell him about the ghost? He thinks we're a couple of drunks. But he promised to come down and see for himself. Mario comes. You tell him what you've seen, good sir. He'll never believe us. <laughs> Profitable seem to me all the uses of this burrow. <laughs> Just another night at the club, but somehow fraught with fell portent. A chill wind blows over yonder flushing meadow. <laughs> Mist lights grimly on the neck of frogs. <laughs> But I, I must cast aside these thoughts. No, oh, tarry shall I while, and banter with my foes. Hey, Fabian, how you doing? <laughs> got any business these days? It's very quiet. We've got a reporter here, though. I am. A reporter. Oh, come on. If you've been spreading that nonsense. 
nonsense about the ghost. Okay, let me give you a piece of advice. Lay off the sauce before it destroys you. <laughs> Angels and ministers of grace, defend us! What art thou? What do you want with me? Listen to me, Mario Cuomo. Speak, I am bound to hear. I am the spirit of Franklin Roosevelt, <laughs> doomed for a term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast and fires, till the foul crimes of the New Deal are burnt and purged away. <laughs> Passing strange, the voice is Roosevelt, the words are Buchanan. <laughs> before the disapproving gaze of some future speaker of the House of Representatives. <laughs> but what has this to do with me? The poor, the disadvantaged, they will need a champion, someone to rise up and make government compassionate again, and to take on the noblest task of all, to become the governor of this great state, as I had been. And then... And then? And then? Who knows? <laughs> I do not believe it. I, the scion of Italian immigrants, governor of the state of New York, I am rendered speechless. Believe me, this is the last time in your life. <laughs> it's coming on to morning now, and I must leave you. Remember me, Mario. Remember my words. Remember. <laughs> interested in politics anyway. Hell, I didn't even want to become a lawyer. Come on, Mario. This is Fabian Palomino. <laughs> You've always been interested in public service. Why, your heroes have been Thomas Moore, Franklin Roosevelt, and Abe Lincoln. Oh, that's just in the press packet. <laughs> <laughs> I have only had one real hero in my entire life. Jolton Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> and only one job that I ever loved. Playing center field for Salisbury at Class D. Wait, what's that? 1951, Branch Rickey gave me $2,000 signing bonus. And I was more than Mickey Mantle. And they say he knew baseball. <laughs> I took the two grand and bought Matilda a wedding ring. Does anybody know about this? No, you see, I played my whole career under assumed names. Wendy with Duke, Lavo McReady, Al Dente. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you leave baseball? Couldn't hit the curve. <laughs> Besides that, I had trouble uh, making decisions at the plate. <laughs> Understand. The uninitiated. Baseball is so simple. Nine feet base to base, right angles, a beautiful green field out in the sunshine. But there's so much that's going on. You're standing there at bat in the late innings. One on, you've got to know which way the wind is going. You've got to see where the infield is shading. You've got to look at the outfield. Is the third baseman moving in? How's the pitcher's arm holding up? 
Is it nobler in the mind to take the inside one or swing for the fences? And? While I was weighing these alternatives, I was generally called out. <laughs> <laughs> when did you leave the game? <clears throat> Mid-50s. I got hit by a pitch. High, hard one, right to the head. For three days without cold, multiple interstitial polysyllabic contusions. <laughs> Meeting. They were going to call a priest and my parents. Fortunately, I pulled through, but that was the end of my baseball career. And of course, with permanent brain damage of that order, there was nothing left of law school. <laughs> Why don't you go home now? It's getting late. Get some sleep. Then talk it over with Matilda and the family. After all, you wouldn't be just another politician. The ghost said you'd be covered. Did this all really happen, or did we but dream? I'll leave the metaphysics to you. I'm just a simple boy. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> our ends. And this push was sculptured to the governor's chair. <laughs> I can do it. I can be governor of the Empire State. Army GOP leaders, the right wing elite, a brand new candidate has emerged. I won't rest
find the public that ignores me. No. I will not practice law on the side when I'm Secretary of State. But it's not a full-time job. All your predecessors kept their businesses. That doesn't make it right. I'll make it a full-time job, even if I don't get paid for it. Ugh, my mother warned me about marrying a ball player. <laughs> Sweetheart, you don't understand. I'll be the greatest Secretary of State in New York history, better even than Carmine DeSapio. <laughs> so, destiny calls? That's about it. Next time, I whip out the telephone. Sweetheart, our love can endure anything, <laughs> even Albany. Oh, you're a devil with words. You've always been able to get around me with your talk, even when we were courting. <laughs> When a man is courting a maid, her charms he frequently praises and commonly uses the phrases of his particular trade. To mechanics, you'd be the nuts. To beekeepers, you'd be the money. Automotively, you're the bear can studs. And to bankers, you're simply money. <laughs> To cats who jive your on the bee, your timber to a sawyer. But legally speaking, here's what you mean to this love-bitten, love-smitten lawyer. You're such an attractive nuisance. <laughs>
dollars a year and send you back to Albany. Sweetheart, it's not me, it's destiny calling. I hear the voice of FDR. <laughs> well, so I guess this is it. I know, I can't do anything about it. No, and I can't do anything without you. Oh. Oh, 
sure I'll stun and even pass the bar. But I'd rather be
diploma listed in right now. Certainly, Mr. Desafio, I'll call him him tomorrow. Corner Fink Cuomo and Charles, how may I help you? Where's Mario, Ethel? He hasn't come in yet, Mr. Fink. Banker's hours. I want to see him as soon as he arrives. Who did you want to talk to? Mr. Cuomo is it in. Who may I say is calling? Matthew Troy? <laughs> I'll tell him you call. I see he has your number. <laughs> Corner of Pink Cuomo and Charles, how may I help you? Good morning, Ethel. I need to see John Flynn right away. Will you see if he's in, please? He's been looking for you all morning. Well, I was at the appellate division. I need to see him, see if he's around, and while you're at it, get me a pot roast on rye. I'll be eating lunch at my desk today. <laughs> Just like always. Mario, we've heard some very disturbing rumors about you. You're not thinking of leaving us for public office. Well, Carol, I don't believe it. Bob Moses said you were just like Don Quixote. I don't believe it. Actually, you're more like Sazu Pitts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're still sore about those junk dealers in Queens. Why, for Pete's sake, that was in 1960. Everyone was against you. Moses, Sam Rosenman, the labor unions, the construction companies. It took three years of litigation to beat them, and then you had to sue your clients for a fee. I love public service. Ask the residents of Queens, ask them in Corona, ask them in Ozone Park. I get things done. And divine providence watches over me. Someday I could run for elective office. I could be governor. Governor? You really think so? I have it from someone who should know <laughs> that I can't miss. Well, stranger things have happened. Maybe you should run. And why stop at governor? Who knows? Someday, you might even be president.
time in as Secretary of State. But you must admit, I consulted everybody. I spoke to you, my parents, your parents, the clergy, the That's neighborhood. That's right, and we're all unanimously opposed. <laughs> Consensus is highly overrated. <laughs> <laughs> so what comes after Secretary of State? Maybe then, I can run for mayor. And after that, governor, and perhaps even president. Why do you think that you could govern the city better than Mr. Koch? 
greatest challenge facing the government of New York City today is crime on the streets. And I personally have the greatest familiarity with this scourge of any candidate on this platform. I, myself, and every member of my family have been mugged. <laughs> Sleep? Really deep. <laughs> That's an act. That's a 
back. What a man! Yes, I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'll give hefty raises to those who sing my praises. The press cannot unnerve me. They're lucky to deserve me. You'll wind up in second place. That's nothing new. I played second base. <laughs> Dealing with unions, I thicker and thicker. Not me, I'm slicker and quicker than you. Ever win? Never once. Join the club! Yes, I will. Yes, I will. Yes, we will. Yes, we will.
know what that means? If you're Catholic and you have a good time, it's a sin. <laughs> if you have a really good time, it's a mortal sin. And so you're depressed. I'm depressed. <laughs> Won't be invented for another 20 years. <laughs> Why don't you relax for a while? How can one? Time flies, so little left, so many choices, so many missed opportunities, so much weakness. Maybe your depression is caused by the loss of your race for mayor. <laughs> oh, get serious. Was Jesus depressed because he wasn't mayor of Jerusalem? Mark it down, megalomania. <laughs> but doctor, can you help me? Of course I can help you. You don't need pills, you don't need therapy. What you need to do is keep a diary. Write down your every most thought and deed every day. You shouldn't miss a day. Good job. 
liberal in the finest tradition. Where is that ball cake I so oft caressed? Where that nasal Minnesota twang, which echoed throughout the land on behalf of the needy and the oppressed? And where your devoted wife, Muriel, who dedicated her life, your career, to marry again, that's what. <laughs> so what are you going to do, Mario? We want to know. Despite every effort I do not yet have, such a quest requires a calling. I do not yet feel. Wow, what eloquence. He should write a book. Or march on Baghdad. To run. <laughs> or not to run. <laughs> That is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of a Republican-controlled state senate, <laughs> or take arms against the sea of troubles, and forthrightly declare my candidacy for the presidency. But what kind of my family? Should I rather not spare them the ordeal and Sherman-like state? If nominated, I shall not run, and if elected, I shall not serve. But, oh, <laughs> the heart to run no more, and by such disclaimer of high office forfeit forever the influence to draw political flesh aspires to rest. Sleep in Albany. 
Hey, there's the rub. <laughs> We're in that provincial pink town. <laughs> what? I have sloughed off any prospect of higher office. What influence will remain to me must give us pause. Domini non so dignus. I am not worthy of the presidency. But Domini non sequitur. I could cut it on the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> and yet there lies a middle way. I could stand aside, and then, if Fabian were to enter me in the lists of New Hampshire, why then, to certain my influence would continue. Oh, God, I, I cannot embrace the nomination, and yet I cannot cast it aside. Thus does conscience make cowards of us all, and the native hue of resolution is simply to bore with a pale cast of thought. Burnham Wood rises up and step by step marches on far rock away. <laughs> Whoa, peasant slave am I. We draw to a conclusion and a couplet. I would not be so sad or have so good if only knew I what Aquinas. As we all know, Mario didn't run. <laughs> Instead, he sought another term as governor of New York. And as our hero awaits his fate, late on election eve, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir appears on cable television <laughs> to announce the final results of the 1994 New York gubernatorial race. Listen, good people, and weep. 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 The vote was close, but what a shame. It's the end of this 12-year reign. He's rejected. He's degraded. He's Now you can work for a white shoe law firm and live on 
sunken place. Oh, what would FDR have thought? I have some dignity left. <laughs> you expect me to become a hood ornament for some institution named after a Republican loser? <laughs> no. No more McLaughlin Group. No more PBS. Maybe a Geraldo once a day. <laughs> the rest is silence.
show. We have been Jean Lehman, who I'd like to ask to come up. Association itself, and they are Nick Marico, who is in charge of arranging uh, this room and the dinner and it seems everything, and Anna Orlov, who was in charge of the tickets, and Alan Rothstein, our general counsel, whose ear I would bend all the time. And from Governor Cuomo's staff, I particularly want to thank his secretary, Mary Porcelli, who is just a voice to me. But where are you, Mary? Are you here? times in the last month, and uh, by now she has become fast friends with my own secretary, Sandy Nydick, who couldn't be here tonight, but uh, she's stuck on Staten Island in the ice. But how about a round of applause for all of the wonderful persons who helped so much to make this night one of the great success. A solemn responsibility, and that is to introduce your master of rebels, who will do to the governor anything that we have neglected to do. <laughs> now, uh, this is not a man on horseback. Uh, instead, he is a Palomino. <laughs> Fabian Palomino, to be specific. I know that he is one of Governor Cuomo's oldest friends, confidants, and advisors. So he probably knows hundreds or thousands of great stories, uh, most of which, unlike Ellen Chartok, he is unwilling to tell. My uh, first contact with Fabian Palomino was a few years ago, when we were trying to get the governor to permit us to roast him while he was still in office. And Evan Davis told me that the person who could get us the quickest answer was Fabian Palomino. And this was a remarkable process. I called Fabian at about 5 o'clock one evening. He said he'd be on a helicopter with the governor, governor in an hour and would let me know just as soon as he could. He called me up at 9 o'clock the next morning, and he told me the governor had politely declined. Now, that was quick action. It told me something about the relationship between these two men. Well, the governor is here tonight, and if it took the results of the 1994 election to get him here as our honored guest, Frankly, I'd rather he was still in office and we were honoring someone less deserving. But in any event, I want to thank Fabian and also uh, the governor's son-in-law, Brian O'Donoghue, and also the governor's uh, assistant, Jason Halpern, and our own Francis Scanlon from our committee for the various parts that each of them played in persuading Governor Cuomo to join us here tonight. I now have the very greatest pleasure of presenting uh, Fabian Palomino, the master of rebels, to watch him and the governor tear each other and us to bits. <laughs> Fabian? Not until then. <laughs> uh, 
I understand the members of the entertainment committee uh, fought over the uh, participation they would have tonight. And since 8 o'clock, the winners have been working in small claims Cuomo was not surprised to receive your invitation. When he read it, he said, it's natural. They only crucify the innocent. At least I'll be better off than another celebrity wrote to me, Joan of Arc. <laughs> he quickly accepted the invitation, though. He was afraid if he declined, there wouldn't be any 12th night this year. <laughs> uh, since working at Wilkie Farr, he found out how hard it is for white shoe friends to find the least person. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you played to convince me that there are not 10,000 useless words in the dictionary. <laughs>
complain, Matilda's complaining that Mario and I lived it up in all of this while we're referring to the court of appeals. That's a contradiction in terms. <laughs> Nobody from New York City lives it up in the court of When Hugh Carey became governor and moved to Albany, he was devastated by the, uh, uh, the bleakness of the social landscape. He didn't know how to describe it. So he turned to his secretary of state, Mario Cuomo. He said, how would you describe it? And almost reflexively, Mario said, it's perpetual Lent. <laughs>
conscience was there before him. He roused up that proud with his how am I doing it attitude and took a poll and found every senior citizen in the city was in favor of capital punishment. <laughs> yeah, he once went to Lord's Battalion Hall and uh, tried to enlist the aid of the PBA uh, to support the campaign. And uh, the question of capital punishment came up. He was trying to explain his position. And he all yelled out in unison, Mario, why don't you listen to your mother? She's in favor of capital punishment. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're a wacky uh, psychiatrist. <laughs> Dr. Von Schmier. <laughs> he should have had Senator Packwood as a client. He didn't mean it. He knew how to keep a diary and disclose it and not have any fear at all of any adverse fallout. Just keep it loosely minded. <laughs> Share his passion for historical accuracy. And what escalates is he'd call him every morning at 7 o'clock to point out the active actors. <laughs> and uh, it would not be Cuomo like for Cuomo to give a Sherman like statement in declining the presidency. It lacks obscurity. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed the music this show. And for that, I have to give credit to 
Rogers and Hart. <laughs> about a sense of humor is that you enjoy whether humor is at somebody else's expense. <laughs> I don't mean that to admit that the cares for being a favorite. I mean it to myself when he gets off the road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another good thing, though, know, is that the present.
tell them there was no help. This is another lie that I'm sharing the truth with. You. They told me, you need someone to defend you, okay? I told somebody who was talking to somebody, probably Markowitz, tell them Fabian Palomino. I've known him for over 40 years, and so Fabian Palomino was supposed to be my defense lawyer. With that kind of defense, I can understand the evolution of the idea pro se. <laughs> regarded by him as a good defense, then every Bailey is not the only defense lawyer who should be in jail. <laughs> like using Gingrich to defend a welfare mother, or George Pataki to defend a judge. <laughs> maybe we're just getting old, Fabian and I. Somebody asked Fabian the other day, Fabian, you're supposed to be smart. What would you do to get America going again? And he gave the answer about Dolgate. Metamucil. <laughs> Actually, you could have worse. Pat Buchanan could have said something nice about it. <laughs> this, is not the, this is not the first time I've been delighted in public. You should know that. I've grown accustomed to it. Uh, I remember it's one of my favorites. It actually happened. I was a lieutenant governor, and I was being introduced by someone who was nervous about it to a group of public school athletic league coaches of baseball and basketball. And so he made the point, this gentleman, by looking at my resume, trying to convince them that I was on that call, athletes, on the athletic side of contract, done this and that, athletic. And then he got to the bottom line and hastily delivered it by saying, and so now I present to you a warm athletic supporter. <laughs> The dean was a very well-known, strident, radical Republican, I'm not going to give him his name, and I knew that he had said many unkind things about me. We were walking up to the stage together, he's escorting me, and I said to him, so tell me, Dean, are you still telling all your students that all of us Democrats were a bunch of darn fools? And without smiling, he said, oh no, Governor, I brought you here to speak so that they could learn for themselves. <laughs> governor anymore. I'm not just a practicing lawyer. And it, I must tell you, it's a very big change. I used to appoint judges. Now I'm required to adore them. <laughs> <laughs> and I found that the whole practice is a lot different now than it was the first time around for me. I enjoyed it the first time around. The old days, I used to think that he who hesitates is lost. Now I'm back to the practice of law, and I've discovered that that may be true, but not if you're going out. <laughs> Not my own rookie bar, Gallagher, because we don't do what I'm about to tell you. But in this other law firm, I was in the library and saw a sign, apparently an instruction to the lawyers who were working there that said, believe it or not, remember, the longer it takes, the more we need takes. <laughs> another law firm, I don't know how many names, but it's the uh, first two names are the same, whose explanation for working the first year associates nearly to death is that they would have more money at the end of the year. You know what they're doing? The young associates in these law firms have not a little too far. But in all the other big firms, <laughs> people were roasting me in front of these firms. They worked them to death, hollering everything. And this guy told me, he said, well, you know, we, we do that if you're right, Mario. He says, but at the end of the year, they have a lot more money. And I said, oh, that's because you give them bonuses. He says, no, God forbid, no bonuses. But we work them so hard, they don't have time to spend the whole time. <laughs> the worst I heard is what they did with holidays. I, I, I couldn't have imagined this. They were so desperate not to lose a lot of time to holidays that one of these firms handed out menorahs with only two candles. <laughs> <laughs> and for the Christians, they circulated a memorandum, Christmas, New Year's, 